right. Oh, come on. I and mean, you got to admit, that's pretty funny. And I know. I would pay $1,000 right now if I could get one of those. You know how many uh, intense moments of fellowship I would have avoided all these years? Hey, man. <laughs> hey, man. To the doghouse you go. All right, let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you so much for a great group of people, Lord, and because we belong to you, Lord, uh, you have put a seed of goodness in all of us. We thank you that you're a good father and that uh, Acts 10, 38 says you went about doing good to all that were oppressed of the devil and healing the sick. And Lord, we want to be more like you and cultivate that seed of goodness that you've put in us. Holy. So we ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, help us to cultivate that seed today and learn all about that as we focus on you and we set aside all distractions. In Jesus' name we say, amen. And so uh, this morning we're continuing our series called Cultivate, and today it's about the goodness of God. Man, uh, thank you, Brittany and team. We sang my favorite uh, song right now, uh, The Goodness of God. I, when I think about that song and I think about how good God is to me, undeservedly, didn't earn it, didn't do anything, uh, he's just, because he's good, and, uh, and I, I, it, just, it just gets me every time. But uh, let's look at the scripture, and um, we're, our text is out of Galatians 5, and this will be kind of a review, and we'll get to what we're going to talk about today. But the fruit of the Spirit, I love the Amplified Version, which is the result of His presence. If you want to know how to cultivate the seeds that God has put in, in you, yeah. get into His presence. I can't say that enough. Get into God's presence. One, the ways we go wrong and we miss sometimes in life is we get out of His presence and we stop listening to His voice and we start listening to other voices, voice of the flesh, vo voice of self, voice of the enemy, other voices, and we make wrong decisions because we listen to the wrong voice. But when we're in His presence, the result of that is love. How many of you need more love? You need to show more love. And you can't get enough love. And God's love is unlimited. And uh, I love the way this defines it. Unselfish concern for others. The way I learned to define it is it's satisfying the needs of everyone else at the expense of self. And we talked about that. Agape love is... If I'm an agape husband, I'm going to look out for my wife's needs before my own. If I'm an agape father, I'm going to look out for my children's needs before what I want to do. If I'm an agape pastor, I'm going to make sure that I'm with all the needs of the people before what I want to do. Are you with me this morning? We need to be more agape people. And so then we talked about how there's really one fruit of the Spirit, love, and how that joy is love's enthusiasm. And we talked about peace. Remember the couple that went through the tornado that we had up here and interviewed them a couple weeks ago? Wasn't that a great service? And how that we can find peace in the storm. And peace is love's trust in God. You know what? If we trust in God, we just know everything's going to be okay. No matter what circumstances say, we know everything's going to be okay. Where we get off is when we start looking at all the circumstances and we make our problems big instead of our God big. And so we talked about peace. Last week, I thought my mom did a fantastic job in a home run with a message on patience. How many of you enjoyed that message on patience? Yes. And we found out that patience is love's endurance. Now this week, we're going to speak about the goodness, the seed of goodness. And so I want to break that down for you. So if we look at the Greek word of goodness... The Greek word is agathusune. Anybody know anybody? Uh, probably not since this century or even last century, but if you know an Agatha, if you lived in the 1800s and are still alive, I don't know, I don't think so. But Agatha, Agatha means goodness. Agathusune is the Greek word. And it means to be, literally, this word literally could be better translated as generous. It means to be generous, big-hearted, charitable, to be a giver. Goodness or generosity, let's define it. It's a supernatural urge. How many of you know 
it's not in our flesh to be a giver. If you don't believe me, work in the nursery for one week. Just volunteer. Just go ahead and go back there. Work in the nursery and hear how many times the kids are going, mine. We, don't, we parents don't teach the kids to go, mine. That is a selfish human nature desire that is naturally us. And so when we grow up, we tend to think that everything we have is mine. This is my time. This is my money. This is my, what is that commercial? It's my money and I want it now. You know, all those people are screaming on the bus or whatever. But uh, yes, thank you. you. You watch some TV, I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I wasn't going to promote any uh, company here. No, I'm just kidding. You all know what I'm talking about. But it's a supernatural urge. Sometimes that goes against the grain of our flesh. Sometimes what the Bible teaches us goes against the grain of what we naturally want to do. But how many of you know it's the right thing to do? Let me ask you a question. Since when has the right thing to do been the easiest thing to do? Thank you. Never. Think about it. Was it easier for you to stay in bed this morning and pull the comforter over your head and not the Holy Spirit, the comforter, and just sleep in that extra hour and watch some TV, chill out and do what you want to do? Or was it easier for you to get up and get ready and, and get to church and worship God? I don't know. Maybe for some of you it was easier because you're in a habit of that. And I'm looking at a lot of good people today. But it's a supernatural urge in a person to reach beyond themselves. Remember, love is at the expense of self and meet the natural needs of those around them. So with that definition in mind, it's a supernatural urge to reach beyond themselves and meet the natural needs of those around them. Let's look this morning at three steps that we can do in our life to cultivate goodness. How many of you want to cultivate more goodness in your life? How many of you want to be producers of goodness in your life? How many of you want the Lord's goodness that we sing about and worship God for this morning to flow through you into the lives of others? And so I've got kind of a story on this. I remember growing up as a child, and I don't even know if my mom and dad even know about this, but when I was a child and my brother and I are a little over two years apart, we didn't have video games, okay? All you, all you guys that grew up on video games... You're blessed in one way that it keeps you out of trouble. We had to make up our own games when I was a kid. And sometimes we made bad choices because we weren't in God's presence. And we made up our own games that were not always good and productive. And one we made was uh, my dad decided one year to go organic. And not only did we have 20 different kinds of fruit trees all over our yard all kinds of fruit, but we had a garden. And I remember the day my dad called in a truckload of chicken manure. And he said, boys, let's go out there. And, and I don't know if he even did, but we did. We shoveled all of that chicken manure. And for two or three weeks, we had complaints from the neighborhood that the sewer was leaking. We had all kinds of, we had the smelliest house on, in the whole neighborhood, but we had the best garden in the whole neighborhood. We had some rich, rich soil, not just for that year, but for years to come, as all that chicken manure went into that, that yard. And, and he, he, he grew okra, uh, tomatoes, uh, chard, Swiss chard, stuff that you're just now learning about in organic vegetables that have been around for years that he knew about. And we grew up very blessed eating organic vegetables and fruits. But where we went wrong is Rick and I, my brother, decided that we would use the tomatoes as we would play army and we would kind of lob some grenades over the fence. And unfortunately, the target of our explosions was going to be Mrs. Self's car. And so we would lob and be, oh, I'll miss that one. And we would lob and we kept lobbing tomatoes over the fence and splat. Oh, got it. You know, I sank her battleship, you know, and all that other good stuff. And uh, tomatoes splat all over the window. Now, we uh, quickly ran inside and we went to look out the window and here comes Miss Self over here, the owner of that car in that house. And Rick and I looked at each other and goes, man, we're in trouble. Because we, how many of you know, we, it wasn't our first rodeo of getting in trouble. We, 
we had had many knocks on the door, and we had many times where we had been uh, scolded and disciplined by my father in the house for doing things with the organic fruit and vegetables. But Miss Self came over, and we looked out the window, and to our amazement, she took out a bottle of Windex and paper towels, and she washed all of the windows on my parents' cars and then went back home. And even my dad looked out the window and said, look at that, Mrs. Self, she's such a good neighbor. She's cleaning our windows. He had no idea why. He might be just now finding out why she did that. But that's what I'm talking about in the Bible teaches reward good for evil. And she was doing an act, and she made an important impression and lesson in my life like, wow, that's what I want to be when I grow up. Yes. I, want to, I want to reward good for evil. And I always remember that. What a, what a great example of goodness. But let's look at three ways to cultivate God's generosity in our heart. And by the way, I, how many of you are ready to learn something today? Yes. You want something deep? I'm going to go past the third grade today, okay? This is going to be a deep one out of the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 9. I'm going to show you, I believe, some revelation that maybe you've never seen before. But... These are three ways. If you want to cultivate goodness, God's goodness and God's generosity, how many of you know we're supposed to be like him? Yes. We're supposed to be conformed to the image of becoming like Christ, not to the image of the world, but we're supposed to be becoming more and more like Christ. So this is a scripture about the goodness of God and the generosity of God. Understand, first of all, we need to understand the reality of God's blessings. Yes. Now, let me explain what I mean. How many of you know there's a difference between perception and reality? You see, I could, I could be convinced in my mind that that wall is not there. And you think, well, that's kind of silly. Well, it's just as silly to me as when an atheist tells me that God is not there. Because to me, I know for a fact beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is there. In fact, God is everywhere. And when he tells me that wall is not there... You know what, I, I, one day, one day, I could believe there's not a wall there, and I could walk in that direction, and one day, I'm going to find out there's a wall there. Can I tell you it like this? One day, every atheist, the Bible says, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The atheist can say all day long, there is no God, but one day, he's going to bow down and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. My hope and my prayer is that he belongs to Jesus Christ and he is truly his Lord and Savior before he has to face eternity. So that's his perception, but reality is there is God. You can say there's no wall there, but reality is if you walk that way, you're going to hit it. <laughs> Are you with me so far? There was a little kid, and uh, I love this story because it explains the point so well. And he, he would say to himself, I'm the greatest baseball player in the world. And he would throw up a ball, and he swung, and he missed. And he said, I'm the greatest hitter in the world. And he swung up a ball and missed, strike two. I'm the greatest hitter in the world. And he swung up, threw up a pitch, and he swung and missed. And he said, I'm the greatest pitcher in the world. <laughs> and in his mind, his perception was he was the greatest in the world. He didn't want to tell Nolan Ryan that at the time or some of the other great ball players. But that's perception versus reality. Sometimes we get perceptions that don't line up with the reality of God's word. And sometimes we can get a perception in our mind that is not the goodness of God or the generosity of God. And let me tell you one of them. Because the key to understanding the reality That everything, can you say everything? everything. Say it again, everything, everything. comes from God. Yeah. Everything that you, that's in existence today, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we partake in, the, the people that we fellowship, everything, everything comes from God. So when I understand the reality of where everything comes from, then I understand who the owner is. My children, that my wife and I, we didn't have to work too hard to create. I'm being honest with you here this morning. You know, 
we were celebrating my birthday. You know? How do you, how do you know that, Rex? Because one was born on July 10th and one was born on July 8th. My birthday is October 3rd. You can do the math. <laughs> two. Two years in a row. And some, some people may say, man, you must really love children. Way back then, you, I was just pop, my, mom, my wife was popping them out, you know. And two years in a row, and only been married for four years. Man, you must really love children. No, I just really love my wife. My grandchild comes from God. Everything that I see, it, they're not mine. They're loaned to me from God. And this is what this scripture says. Look at this in, in 2 Corinthians 9. And God will generously, agathosune, generous, generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Wow, what a good father. In other words, he says, I'm going to create you on this earth and I'm going to make you a manager of my things and my stuff and my time and my money and my creation, but I'm going to give you so much that it's going to meet your needs and you'll have plenty left over to share with others. Now, either you believe that reality or you don't. You may have a perception of something else and, and some of you may already be tuning me out. Because you may be thinking, oh, he's talking about money. I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about time. I'm talking about talents. I'm talking about gifts. I'm talking about everything that we do or every action we do. They're God's. That we can give glory to God or we can hoard them for ourselves. Yeah. And so it all comes from God. The second reality of God's blessings uh, is that we realize that blessings have an eternal impact. You know what's cool is that when I bless someone, when I do the goodness of God and show the generosity of God to someone, and it could be with my time, it could be an act of kindness, it could be uh, just a smile at somebody. When I do something like that, it has eternal impact. Look at the scripture again. It, it says, as the scriptures say, the next verse, they share freely and give generously to the poor their good deeds will be what? Remembered forever. In other words, every good deed we do on this earth, first of all, God keeps track. And God keeps good books. And if you know the Father, like I know the Father, which I know most of you do, you know that He pays back more. He's a then some God. In fact, in, in my translation of the Bible, His name is Jehovah then some. Because he gives you all you need and all you want and all you ask for, and then some. That's what Ephesians 3.20 says. And so every good thing that we do, God has a way of multiplying. Remember the, the boy that did a good act? And what a great example of love is the people were hungry. Jesus was given an all-day seminar. I would have loved to hear that, all-day seminar from Jesus. And there were uh, 5,000 men in attendance and probably 20,000 people, counting women and children. And this little boy had five loaves and two fishes. And instead of eating them for himself, you know that little boy was hungry. How many of you know little boys can eat? Little boys can pack it away. But he said, here you go, Jesus. And Jesus took it and multiplied it and fed over 20,000 people that day. And there was Jehovah then um, multiplied it to where there was 12 baskets left over. Now, if God can do that for that little act of bo lo love that that little boy showed, tell me he can't do it for you and I. That's right. So that's the reality of God's blessings. They have eternal impact and they, uh, they come from God. Everything comes from God, but God uses us to, uh, as a channel. Now, let's look at the second way to cultivate the generosity of God and the goodness of God. We need to understand the reason. So we know the reality. What's the reason for God's blessings? Why would God want to bless me? Why would God want to bless you? Well, this scripture continues to break it down. Look at the next verse, and we're going to see this verse repeatedly. But for God is the one, everybody say God is the one. God is the one. Who provides seed. Everybody say seed. seed. Every blessing 
The Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, gives us the fruit of the Spirit in seed form. Every blessing from God comes in seed form. And he, it's up to us to take that seed form and, and make something uh, of it. For the farmer, and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and produce a great harvest of generosity in you. You see, God could choose to say, you know what, Robert has a need today, and he's been praying, and so I'm just going to make it rain on Robert. I'm just going to, he, he's going to look up to the sky, and money is going to fly out of heaven towards him. Do you believe God could do that this morning? Would Robert love for that to happen? Yes, of course. Would we love for that to happen? Yes, of course. But instead, God says, no, you know what? Instead of just blessing Robert from one of my actions, I'm going to ask Brother Merv over there, and I'm going to lay it on his heart to go bless Robert, and that way I can bless two people. Because I can bless the blessee, and I can bless the blessor. See how good God is? And so that's what he's saying right here. And, and so, so, so let's look at a flow chart for a second. I'm a very analytical thinker, and so I think in terms of charts and things like that. Uh, so let's just take, for example, what Pastor Rick was talking about, the tithe, 10%. So if God gives us a seed, in other words, God gives us money, and he expects us to turn it back to him, the seed, the tithe. Now watch what God says. If you do that, watch what he says in 2 Corinthians. Then... He's going to turn that seed into bread. What does that represent? Bread. We even used to use it in the 70s. Some of you aren't old enough. You weren't even born in the 70s. Some of you were born. But there was a hippie slang thing going, man, I need some bread. I see some of you shaking your head. Man, I need some bread today. Man, I got to make some bread. I got to make some dough, man. And, and that was a terminology. And, and that comes from the Bible. That bread represents uh, our bills, our sustenance, our just enough. What did God do when the children of Israel were in slavery and God set them free from slavery and, he, and then they were in the wilderness for 40 years? He gave them bread, manna. And it was just enough manna every day to take care of their sustenance and their bills. Some of us are living in the wilderness right now. We're out of slavery. God has set us free. Praise God. But we're in the wilderness and God is giving us just enough, right? And God wants you to go to the next level. He wants you to go in the promised land where it's a land of milk and honey, where it's a land of abundance. Do you believe that this morning? He wants to bless you. He wants to take you to the next level. But it's not just about seed and bread. Because you see, the next thing he says is, then if you're faithful in the seed, the tithe, and you use good stewardship in paying your bills in wisdom, then I'm going to give you increase. I'm going to give you more. That's the Jehovah then sum. I'm going to give you enough because guess what? I don't want you just staying with tithe and paying your bills. You're living in the wilderness. I want to take you into the promised land. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put on your heart to bless in the form of offering. Offering is defined as above 10%. So God is starting to bless me. So I say, you know what? Babe, let's start giving 11% because I know the church has needs and so there's mission, uh, there's homeless to be fed and there's uh, prisoners that need to be ministered to and all the seven different mission organizations we support here at LifeSpring Church. Let's not only give our tithe to take care of the bread, but let's give increase to take care of some of these independent things that God wants us to, to, to bless. And so... That's offerings. Look at what this scripture says in 2 Corinthians again. For God is the one who provides the what? Seed for the farmer. What's the farmer? Those who are willing to sow. If you're not willing to, then he won't. You know what he's going to do? Eventually, Rick read the scripture, the seed's going to get cut off. And that's dangerous. And, and so he provides the seed for the ones who are willing to sow. And then he provides all your bills. He's going to take care of all that. And in the same way... He will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. And it goes on to say, yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. You know what Robert's going to do when he gets that 
that uh, blessing from my dad that he's been praying for, he's going to thank God. And I'm going to tell you something. Many people, many, many people get led to Christ because of generosity. In fact, Romans 2.4 says this. The goodness, the agathosune of God leads to repentance. Not the condemnation, not the wrath of God, not the judgment of people. It's the goodness. The generosity of God leads people to repentance. You know what happens? Is people begin to see, man, that Pastor Merv, he's kind of got a good life. I don't know what's going on, but he's never been one that made a lot of money, yet everything gets taken care of, and something's going on, and he, ha he always has more than he needs, and he's, he has joy in his life, and he has peace, and Man, I wish I could have that. And so then they come to Pastor Merv and say, Hey, what are, what are you doing that I'm not doing? What can I do to, to, to get that? And it's a perfect opportunity to lead them to Christ. Are you with me this morning? This is reality. Either you believe it or not. It doesn't hurt my feelings if you don't believe it. That's okay. It's, you can take it up with God because it's His Word. Uh, uh, real quick, I'm going to read a, a story in, that happened to Moses in the Old Testament, and then uh, we're going to get off of this and go to the next point. But Moses summoned B and O and all the others who were specially gifted in the Lord and were eager to get to work. Now, there's a key. <laughs> and Moses gave them the materials donated by the people of Israel as sacred offerings for the completion of the sanctuary. So they had a building program in Moses' day. And Moses gave up, and the people continued to bring additional gifts. The people continued. Notice this. And each morning, every morning, somebody brought, oh, here's some more lumber. Oh, here's some more nails. Oh, here's some more, you know, here, let, let's build this thing. And the, the craftsmen who were working on the sanctuary left their work. They went to Moses and reported, Moses, the people have given more than enough. Everybody say more than enough. Materials to complete the job the Lord has commanded us to do. Do you believe the Lord has a job for each and every one of you to do? Yes. You bet. It's called the assignment of God or the calling of God. God has a purpose for you. God did not create you just to live for yourself. He created you with a purpose. He's a God of purpose. Everything He created has a purpose. The birds have a purpose. The dogs have a purpose. Everything He created has a purpose. And you and I have a purpose. And so... Moses gave the command, and, and I dare y'all to make, make me say this. He gave the command, and this message was sent throughout the camp. Men and women, don't bring any more gifts. You're too generous. We have enough. So the people stopped bringing their sacred offerings. Their contributions were more than enough to complete the whole project. Wow. It's amazing when a group of people get energized for God and let the Agatha Sune, the generosity of God, shine through. And I'm not, please don't feel beat up. Please don't feel beat up. I know that God is working on all of us and he's teaching all of us to cultivate this. But the, the formula goes seed, bread, increase, and then generosity. That way everybody gets the blessing. And so let's look at the third thing. That was the reality of God's blessing and the reason for God's blessing. The third one is, let's talk about the results of God's blessing. The results of generosity. And the first one we have to say is that God gets the glory. Amen? God gets the glory. It's nothing we do. If, 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 uh, if Pastor Murray gives to Robert, it, it's not, he doesn't get the glory. It's a good thing that he did. But he gives to Rob. Look at this. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Robert, now God's blessed you. Now who are you going to give? Oh, wow. All right. I just got a blessing. Thank you very much. But wait. I'll, here. There you go. Oh, man. Look at that. Hey, if anybody wants to add to it, I didn't bring any cash today. Oh, yes, I did. Hold on, here, add this to it. I didn't know I had that in there. 
Add that to it and just uh, feel free to give as God has given and let it, let it go. Let's see what happens with it. But anyway, God gets the glory. God gets the glory. That's the exciting part. Look at this scripture as it goes on. It says that two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers at Live Spring Church, come on, let's make it personal, it will be met and they will joyfully, can we say joyfully? You know what? Jesus said it's better to what? Give than receive. So I dare say that Robert had more joy than he did in receiving that $20 bill. He had more joy in passing along that blessing to someone else. And then I added to it and had, that was my joy to give. And uh, let's keep it going. And, and uh, joyfully express their thanks to God. And if it lands on you and you really need it, you've been praying for it, you keep it and use it, okay? But the second thing that results as generosity and as we let the goodness of God shine through is that it makes a huge, huge difference in the lives of others. That's, that's what we can never underscore. Because of your generosity, we're able to be right here in this location, in this church. This, this is a miracle story. I don't know if y'all realize this or not. But we started with 30 people in my house. And God, and I know it, it doesn't look like much today because of uh, spring break and time change. But you just wait and you see what God is doing. And all the people that have gone on into other ministries and things. We have no idea until we get to eternity. Man, you remember that time you did that? And we forgot about that act of generosity. But God, but there are people that never, ever forget. It makes a huge difference. This is what the scripture wraps up with in that verse. It says this. As a result of your ministry, your ministry, every one of us has one, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient. Everybody say obedient. obedient. To the good news of Christ and they will pray for you with deep affection. Deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God. Can we say thank God? Come on, let's say it again. Thank, Thank God, God for this gift too wonderful for words. Man, I'm going to wrap it up with a story that's, that's, uh, that I saw. Uh, this teaching in action. And uh, my dad, as you, some of you know, pastored a church uh, over in Hawaii for 26 years. But before that, there was New Life Fellowship for 20, 21 years. And before that, he was, he's been in ministry since 14 years old. And today he's 77. I mean, come on, that's a general right there in the face. And so he had a man that was an assistant pastor, an associate pastor at the time at the, at the church where we were at in, in Garland. And this man's name was John. John was a good man. He came out of YWAM. Came from Holland. His last name was Denharder. They have funny names overseas, you know. But that was his name. And he went and he felt like God was calling him later on to go uh, plant a church. And so he did somewhere in the Metroplex area. And it went for a while, but he had troubles. He had frustrations. In fact, he was, he was so depressed and down in the dumps that another pastor friend of mine went over there to pray for him and help him out of his funk. And he was just crying and in a fetal position, just, just pulling his hair out. And so John just decided to close the church down. And then, you know, this guy, Doug, ministered to him and prayed for him and helped him. They were, they were best friends. And John decided to go to California. He went to California. He started another church. And in California, he had this small work and an elderly lady called him up one day and says, Hey, Pastor, I would like to come to your church, but I live nearly an hour away. And I don't, I'm not, uh, I, I can't drive, I'm, I'm, I'm impaired. And would you mind come pick me up? He said, okay. So John began to drive almost an hour out of his way, pick up this lady and bring her to church. 
And this lady just loved the church, had a great time, and, and God moved on her heart. She had been coming for about a year, and God moved on her heart and impressed on her, hey, Agatha Sune. I don't know if her name was Agatha. It might have been. She was really old. But Agatha Sune, be, be generous. Be generous with this pastor. And so God put on her heart, and he told, she told John one day, hey, you know what? God is impressed on me because she, he had had her over at his apartment and it wasn't the best, you know, cleanest apartment. And, you know, it was in a bad part of town. You know what I'm talking about. And so God told her and she said, John, I want to buy you a house in California. He's like, wow, I've been praying for, for a house. And, and so she said, just, just look around and find something and I'll pay for it. And so he's like, oh, thank you. And so he looks around and he finds an old, beat up, shabby townhome. And he calls the lady up and says, I found it. I want to pick you up and show it to you. And I want you to check out this home. And he's kind of, you know, excited. <laughs> this was a broken down townhome that was a lot better than where he lived, but it was still not the greatest. And so... He, she, he picked her up and took her and she just like went no this isn't it tell you what you let me find you a house do you trust me he goes oh, okay well you're the one giving the blessing so okay so why don't you just you, you go find one so about three or four months later he said, she called and said okay come pick me up and they went and they started driving towards the ocean and they went to a property, this is, this is back, you know, before, this is almost like the 2000, like the turn of the, the millennium. So it was a long time ago when prices were a lot lower. But even back then, she held up the keys as they pulled in the circular driveway to the oceanfront $2 million property in California that she said, it's yours. And he's like, Oh my goodness, you know, I mean, after he picked himself off the floor and she goes, you don't know this, but my husband wrote the songs for Disney years ago and he's passed away and I get all the royalties. And he's like, wow! <laughs> Praise God! See, you never know what one act of generosity, that's the thing what God does. One act of generosity goes on and on and on and on. As we bow our heads and close our eyes this morning, I just want God to tug on your heart and I want you to kind of look into your heart. And if you're here today and you could say, God, maybe, maybe you're here today, first of all, and you say, I don't know God like I should. In fact, God seems like He's a million miles away on another planet. I don't feel very close to God. Would you just slip your hand up this morning because we want to take care of that today. Yes. Just slip your hand up. Say, I need to be close. Yes. I need to be closer to God. Come on, don't miss your moment with God. I need to, yes. Come on, slip your hand up if you want to be closer and have that relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes. You need to be closer with God. Now let's all just stop for a second and let's say this prayer together to get closer to God and to renew our relationship with Jesus Christ. Can we say, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I thank you. I thank you. For the most generous act ever. For the most generous act ever. That you gave your son. That you gave your son. Who you love so much. Who you love so much. To this earth. To this earth. And he died on the cross. And he died on the cross. For my sins. For my sins. And my failures. And my failures. Forgive me for those. Forgive me for those. I want you, Jesus. I want you, Jesus. To be my Savior. To be my Savior. And not only that. And not only that, I want you, Jesus. I want you, Jesus, to be the Lord. To be the Lord of my life. Of my life. And I believe. And I believe in the resurrection of Jesus. In the resurrection of Jesus. And I believe. And I believe that I can overcome. That I can overcome with Jesus Christ. With Jesus Christ. In my heart. In my heart. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's give God some praise because all of heaven is right now. Now. Real quick in closing, I know we're, we're done here, but I just hope God is speaking to you. And I just want to pray a blessing over you because 
I don't know, all of us, even if we're the most generous person, we're not near what Jesus was, right? And we're supposed to be becoming more and more and more like Jesus. So let's just receive this blessing. Can you just hold your, can you just stand up this morning? Can you just hold your hands out like this as a receiving posture? You're like a satellite dish. You're a receiving posture. And you want to catch what comes out of heaven right now. And Father, we just ask. Lord, we ask. We thank you for a seed of generosity that has been put in our spirit. And there's a seed down there. But God, forgive us for the times when we've tromped on that seed and not watered that seed and not allowed your sun to shine on that seed. Forgive us for the time where we've covered up that seed. God, we want to cultivate that seed. God, if we're a married man in here, we want to be a better husband to our wives. We want to be more generous with our time, with our gifts, with our money. Lord, if we're a, a father in this house, we want to be a better father. God, cultivate. Let us help us Strengthen us. Let us cultivate that seed of generosity to spend more time with our kids. God, if we're the type that's kind of stingy and holds on and believes everything is mine, God, we pray, a, break that spirit in Jesus' name. Break the spirit of poverty. Break the spirit of tight wattedness. <laughs> break the spirit, Lord, that would think that it's mine. And Lord, let us cultivate continually your fruit, your seed, Lord, your time, your money, your, your abilities. Lord, if we're a woman in this house, God, we pray that we become better wives to our husband, Lord. Let us, let us show generosity, Lord, generosity towards our husband. Let us be concerned with his need. Let us be better mothers to our children. God, give us creative ideas to share with our kids so that we can spend more time and bond with them. Lord, with our church, Lord, let us be better congregation members, Lord, to meet the needs. Let us be sensitive. Lord, let us be sensitive when there are people around us that have needs, and not just in our church, but in our community, Lord. Let the spirit of Agatha Sune, the spirit of generosity, flow out of us. Make us, Lord, a channel of your generosity as we bless all those around us, as we truly believe that we are blessed to be a blessing. And we receive that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Come on, let's give God some praise this morning. Hey, God bless you. The worship band's going to sing this awesome song again. If you want to hang out and worship, feel free. If you want to meet me in that room, I'll be happy to talk with you. And God bless you. Next week, we're talking.